But first, we wanted to welcome back our good friend and comrade, Dr. Tarek Lubani. Tarek is an emergency physician based in London, Ontario, and he's worked shoulder, shoulder to shoulder with physicians in Gaza for many years. Tarek's also the medical director of the GLIA Project, which makes high quality open source medical equipment. Tarek, welcome back to the Electronic Intifada live stream. Thank you very much for having me. Hi, Tarek. Hi. Um, so can you just give us a sense of what your colleagues uh, in Gaza are uh, reporting in terms of the medical situation um, from the north to the south? Uh, what do you know about, you know, I mentioned in the report, all of these closures of, um, of uh, not just like hospitals and clinics, but also field hospitals, um, uh, especially in the South. What do you know about um, what's happening in terms of the medical situation right now? Yeah, the medical situation is obviously disastrous. I think right now our gaze is very much firmly set on Rafah, both because that's where a lot of new activity is happening but also because that's where a lot of internet connectivity, cameras, and people are. The situation, if you wanted to go to the furthest north, um, has been absolutely dismal for many months now since it was totally disconnected from the south. And so even though there has been some very minor movement uh, of, of some supplies into the north, it really hasn't been enough to keep up with the needs. One of the things that is good news, it's really wonderful news, was the reopening of the dialysis center in Shifa Hospital this week. That is the effort, the Herculean uh, effort of so many Palestinians who have come together to insist on life, to insist on treating their patients in the best way that they can. And so they reopened five to six seats. I think by now it's probably six to seven seats at the dialysis unit there, incredible, incredible work. However, the hospitals are continuously being retargeted. Kemal Adwan, as I think you had reported previously, um, has come completely out of service again. And every other hospital in the North, with the exception of Al-Ahli, um, is completely non-functional. Al-Ahli was partially functional when that report that you had uh, put online, put on screen, was uh, was posted, that was by Dr. Um, Naeem, Dr. Fadl Naeem. However, having said that since then, it has become essentially non-functional. In the South, we had a semi-functioning medical system that has been seriously degraded over the last two weeks, I guess three weeks, since the Israelis began their attacks, escalated their attacks on Rafah. And over the last two days, as you had noted, every one of those hospitals has now shut. Earlier, about uh, two or three hours ago, Emirati Hospital, which in one of your reports you'd referred to as uh, Tel Sultan uh, Maternity Hospital, um, was, was shelled by tanks that were outside the Southwest door, one of the more important doors in. And that site in February had been bombed by a drone with uh, a missile. So what we saw was at that point, Emirati fully closing. All of these hospitals knew that bad things were coming. And at this point, we have seen such a thorough failure of the international community that there was no sense that, okay, you know, the doctors will just stick around because we knew that if the doctors stick around, they'll be arrested. They'll be part of the mass graves. All of their patients will be murdered. And so the, there was a decision taken on the hospital level for Palestinian patients, their doctors, and for, of course, the international solidarity medical teams uh, to withdraw as many patients as possible, and then at the last moment, withdraw the sickest patients, understanding that some of them would die. In Emirati, that means that the incubated patients, the ventilated patients, the youngest premature babies were pulled out yesterday, and of course, um, I, I haven't seen final numbers because things have been so hectic, but the expectation is that their situation would have deteriorated or they could have even died in transport. And, and where would they, Tarek, where would they even go? Where would they even take these incredibly vulnerable patients, babies who might be just days or weeks old and who require incubators and very intense and special care? Where can you take them? 
in such a situation? Yeah, that was, of course, the question. And there isn't really anywhere to take them. They were taken from Emirati to Nasser Hospital. And as you know, Nasser Hospital was completely pillaged and destroyed uh, just weeks ago. So it's it's testament, you know, I, I described it as Herculean, like maybe Sisyphean is like a better description because the Palestinians keep rebuilding. They keep focusing on, on creation and life and the Israelis keep destroying. They focus on, on death and destruction. But, and Tarek, but yeah. they, were, they were taken to Nasser. And Tarek, at this point, is there any pretense by Israel that it is not just directly and deliberately attacking the hospitals? I mean, do they still pretend that, the, that you know, this is somehow incidental or accidental or that did they still tell the lies about Hamas having command centers or they just do it knowing that uh, no one with any power or authority is going to stop them? No, I mean, no, they, they don't issue any explanations or communiques. The Indonesian hospital where the Glia team was based and actually lived for a significant period of time, um, the top floor, which was one of the places where we had stayed, was just shelled. And initially, you know, when I heard about the first shelling, I wondered, oh, okay, like, is it a one-off? Because they've occasionally, in previous wars, hit these hospitals once or twice and left them alone. No, they shelled that top floor until there was no top floor. And similarly with Emirati, I don't think any of us can pretend that they didn't know they were shelling it. The other thing too, it's not just the destruction of, of these places, it's also rendering them inoperable. So for example, in Kuwaiti, Kuwaiti wasn't destroyed, but they killed several people, several of the medical staff, and made it very evident that if you don't shut this down, we're going to kill you all or destroy this whole place. So Kuwaiti was functionally rendered inoperable. Najjar similarly two weeks ago. And of course, the Washington Post reported about a week or so ago, we mentioned this, that the Turkish Friendship Hospital, which was the main or only cancer treatment center uh, in Gaza, and it's in central Gaza, the Israelis are now using as a military base. One question, Tadak, just for viewers who are coming on you. We often talk about the Kuwaiti hospital, the European hospital, the Indonesian hospital, the Turkish hospital, and so on. Why do these hospitals have these names? Um, I'll answer that in a moment, but just to pull on the thread that you were talking about with cancer care. Cancer care has been so poor this entire time, and actually after the Turkish hospital was attacked, um, all of the cancer care transferred to a clinic called Fatima Zahra, which was among the first that went when, because uh, it's close to Najjar when the Israelis came in. So cancer care is, is uh, really terrible. I mean, I, I pity any person who has, especially these preventable or treatable cancers. As for why they have these names, it's because the Ministry of Health has been robbed of its ability to run many of these hospitals. And so in order to make them work, they enter into partnerships with either national governments or with aid agencies from those governments. So for example, the Emirati Hospital, the one that uh, uh, you guys referred to earlier as the Tel sultan Maternity Hospital, that's sponsored by the um, Red Crescent in the UAE, the Kuwaiti Hospital, similarly by the Red Crescent in Kuwait, and so on, the Mercy Corps Hospital and so on. So these hospitals have names because those are the countries that have contributed substantially to getting those hospitals running. They all remain, not to get too in the weeds here, they all remain under Palestinian control, direction, and, and sovereignty. However, they're, they're run, organized, and funded in conjunction with these national governments. You know, it just it's also important to remember that... Uh, the cancer treatment, for example, uh, was n not a readily available thing before October 7th. I mean, for 17 years, the siege on Gaza um, has meant that people uh, had to go elsewhere to get uh, common cancer treatments in, in Egypt, for example. Um, it's it's just it's it's incomprehensible that people um, are are not able to get you know 
a, a ordinary treatment for things. Well, I mean, diagnosis. In diagnosis, exactly. Like, it, yeah, the, I mean, di you know, a, a doctor was was telling us a few weeks ago that you know there's no MRI machines, um, and and then after a massacre like the one on Sunday, and again Monday and Tuesday, um, we saw uh, doctors saying that there's no place uh, in the South um, for people to receive burn treatment. Um, how are physicians, medics, paramedics, ambulance crews, uh, you know, f family doctors able to treat people who are coming in with these uh, unbelievable injuries without any way to treat them? Yeah, I mean, you're right. The situation with cancer care is is really deplorable and terrible. Cancer has to be treated through tissue diagnoses. There were three people on October 6th who could do tissue diagnosis, that is to say pathology, and they were all killed throughout this war. So we're really looking at a situation where even if everything were to stop tomorrow, we can't make tissue diagnoses of cancers, which means functionally, we can't know how best to treat them, we have to guess. So the, the situation with cancer, you're right, it's been 17 years. And where you might say, if you wanted to take the Israeli perspective, okay, fair enough, we're not gonna let radioactive isotopes in, which are a major part of, of uh, cancer treatment, um, there's no justification for not allowing chemotherapy in, which is the other major part of cancer treatment. Even today, there should be no shortage of chemotherapy. There's nothing stopping it from going in most of the stuff doesn't need fridges. It doesn't need anything special. Yes, it's highly toxic, but should be going in. And that brings us to the topic of all of the medications. The system was so broken that it was doctors like uh, the various medical teams, GLIA being one, that would load themselves up with bags and bags of donated medical supplies and bring them in. So of course, when those emergency medical teams stopped coming in, so did the medical supplies, which makes treatment essentially impossible. Even if you had a burn unit, where are you going to get the specialized burn gauze for it? Where are you going to get the creams that you need? And I mean, burns are such a special part of medicine. The first time that I ever saw a person who had been burned up, I was actually in Fallujah in Iraq, um, young into my career. And there was a person, there was a car that had been bombed a few cars ahead of the one that I was traveling in. And that was the first that I really smelled that burned flesh. To give you an idea of what that all means, when somebody gets burned, they instantly lose the biggest organ in their body or parts thereof. The people who were in the tent massacre, those who, who fried to a crisp, who charred, those people, they were going to die, but not everybody else has to die. Not everybody who gets burned has to die. If you can treat them with the proper gauzes and burn dressings, then you'll end up in a situation where those, those burns don't get infected. When somebody loses their skin, they also start to lose a lot of fluid. Your skin retains a lot of your fluid. And so you have to replace that fluid very quickly. Well, where are the IVs? There are no IVs. Where are the fluids? There are no fluids. Where are the trained people? There are no trained people. We're talking about the burn victims going to what now we refer to as TSPs, trauma stabilization points. And those TSPs were so ill-equipped that they could not, they could not care for the burn patients who came because the job of a TSP is to stabilize a severely injured patient and to send her, him, or them over to some place where they can be provided definitive care. Well, the, the run on uh, Rafah was so fast that there was no way. Every team was pinned down. Our team, our GLIA team, has already been displaced twice in the last three weeks. And so that is the same case for every team, Palestinian and international. Of course, the Palestinians, many more than twice. So we're talking about a place where you can't provide the care because you don't have the equipment, you can't move the people, and you can't provide the care on, on the location because you're worried, you know, you're pinned down, you're worried, you can't go into the open, you can't uh, freely move so you can take care of your patient. And none of the systems are set up for that. 
you know, the World Health Organization um, is doing an okay job. I think we can all say that they're doing very badly in some ways and they're doing their best in other ways. The World Health Organization was set up for floods and earthquakes. They weren't set up for a like genocidal, maniacal army trying to exterminate everything in its path. So of course it doesn't know what to do right now. Of course they don't. Most of the international medical teams that are really experienced are also experienced in wars where there was respect for medical teams. When I was in Ukraine, I never worried that the Russians were going to bomb me in the hospital. I never worried that when I was in an ambulance, somebody was going to kill me. You know, these things, as, as much as people want to vilify the Russians, you know, we never worried about that. And yet in, in the Gaza Strip, our teams worry every moment that they are next. And I want to say that's even with the privilege of being internationals. Never mind the Palestinians of whom hundreds have been killed already, hundreds. And another probably one or two hundred are in, in some kind of torture death camp outside of Gaza, just waiting to either die or sometime be released. And uh, Tarek, you, you talked about how people with these horrific burn injuries cannot be properly treated inside Gaza, which means that people who could be saved, people who could live will probably die and that's just must be a a dreadful reality for doctors and medics who know that they could save patients if they had the medical equipment but now there isn't even a chance for any of these people to be evacuated from Gaza because Israel invaded and closed the Rafah crossing now uh, is it 3 weeks ago uh so even though very few of the tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of injured people now in Gaza were able to leave Gaza for medical treatment. But there was a small number who could leave uh, and who were taken out. And I don't know if it was the most severe cases. Certainly these burn injuries would be considered among the most severe cases. But talk about the effect of the ongoing Israeli closure of the Rafah crossing, both to patients like this and to medical teams like the GLIA team and other teams where you now have people, doctors and medics outside Gaza who want to come in who can't, and you have colleagues who are in Gaza who would not be able to leave if they, if they needed to be uh, you know, rotated out. Talk about the closure of Rafah. Yeah, and I mean, to talk about burn deaths, Every doctor who has been in an emergency long enough or has dealt with burn deaths has sat with a patient. There are burns so severe that it doesn't matter how quickly you get to them, that patient will die. Burn deaths are some of the most traumatic for everybody involved because they're awake. They're looking at you, they're talking to you. And especially people who have, let's say, 100% burns, you know that those people will die. There's not much that you can do to salvage that. And so sometimes, you know, all of us, I have sat, you know, inhaling the charred sort of smell of the patient in front of me, knowing that he or she will die, holding their hand and just waiting for that moment to come as all of the steps go through and their body fails until that moment. That, that inevitability is now being translated, just like you had said, on patients where it's preventable. And so you have doctors, and we hear these stories, I hear this from my colleagues who are absolutely devastated. You know, each of us has the one kind of case that we have a really hard time with, but very few doctors are able to tolerate or able to stand the burn cases because they're awake, they're looking at you, they're begging you, they're burned, and you know in these cases that they can be salvaged, that they can be treated if only you had. If only you had some antibiotics, if only you had the burn dressing, if only you had the ability to transfer them out. The closure killed so many patients. The day that the closure happened, there were 68 patients waiting to exit into Gaza, into Egypt. Those patients are almost certainly dead because the, the patients who hit those lists were not the patients who were okay. They were the patients who were already on their way to death. And that was one of the best ways that we could sort of try to treat them. Those patients are almost certainly dead. 
And since then, you can imagine at least 100 or 200 or 300 who've needed transfer and haven't been able to transfer. And those numbers just go up and up as the Israeli attacks intensify. So when you're talking about the closure, the closure has had basically three devastating effects. We can't get the patients out. That's a devastating effect. We can't get medication in. That's a devastating effect. The only mechanism for getting the, the, the medication in was Rafah border for quite a while, for literally months from, um, from December 25th, 2023 until May 6th. That was the only way that medications and medical supplies was getting in any meaningful quantity. And then the third thing is the movement of international staff. Now, I want to be very, very clear. International staff have not experienced any suffering as compared to our Palestinian brothers, sisters, and siblings who are in the hospitals and who are in the healthcare system. However, one of the things that we were able to do, that many teams were able to do, was to provide a little bit of relief, a little bit of solidarity, to sort of help mitigate the worst parts of being a, a healthcare worker in these hospitals. And so now those teams can't rotate. On the day of, the GLIA team got stuck, of course. So did every team. And since then, even though you know the United Nations has been, I'd say, valiantly trying to get people in and out, the fact is that you have to filter through the same army that is trying to kill everybody. And so, of course, they're not going to make it easy. For example, just today, just a few minutes before air, we found out that a British doctor will not be allowed to exit. Why? Because they're like, well, you know, he's, uh, he's of Palestinian origin. Well, then why'd you let him in? You know, they're the ones who let him in and they won't let him out. And as a result, you know, that person now has to leave a seat empty. How many people are allowed in and out through each of these rotations to give you an idea? Tomorrow, it is five people allowed out, now four, because this doctor has been denied. It's not like we can replace him. And how many people are allowed in tomorrow? Five. And of them, if the Israelis make any decision at all, then they can just deny. So for example, the very first of these rotations where the Israelis have full control, there were four seats for international medical staff and three of them went unfilled because of various Israeli denials and procedural, I guess, tricks is the best way to describe it. One person went in for a rotation. We were promised this week three rotations of 25 each. One of them was completely elim eliminated, and then the other two were reduced to 20 each. That means uh, basically 40 people. So it's, it's absolutely, and that's for the entire system. The medical part of that, as I mentioned, is four or five per, per one of these episodes. So the closure is basically a closing of the little straw through which all of Gaza was breathing. But I want to take a moment to reflect on the primary um, sort of person responsible or entity responsible, which is Israel, but then on all the other entities responsible. Like, yes, Israel is stopping aid from getting in. Yes, Israel is stopping us from moving in and out. Yes, that is all true. However, Jordan has the keys. Egypt has the keys. If Egypt opens the keys to the border, that is it. That is the end of the blockade. If Jordan opens the keys to their border with Israel, guess what? That's the end of the blockade too. And, and similarly, any of the countries with populations easily 10 times the size of Israel and militaries many times the size of Israel could sail into Rafah and could, could put a boat with a bunch of aid on the ground and effectively end the, the blockade. So I understand that it's not, quote, that simple. However, this is a situation that calls for extraordinary measures. And I don't think any of us should forgive all of the other international entities with plenty of resources to break the siege that are absolutely refusing to. Yeah. Where, are the, where is the flotilla of ships from um, you know the so-called humanitarian West, they have hospital ships, they have navies. Mm -hmm. The only time they deployed their navies was against Yemen, which is trying to intervene to stop this genocide. So they sent their navies out 
to ensure that the genocide continues. It is absolutely unforgivable. They could be doing so much more. They could be challenging Israel. The, the European countries that claim that claim to uphold human rights and international law. Spain has a significant navy. They just recognized Palestine. Spain sends weapons to Ukraine. Spain, uh, you know, even Ireland, a neutral country, has sent tens of millions of, of euros worth of military aid. They call it non-lethal aid, but it's still military aid. I mean, if you were to send a, a helmet or a vest to Hamas, they would say you're aiding terrorism. So Ireland can't get around the fact that it is supporting uh, the war in Ukraine with military aid. So what do we get instead? We get declarations of support, but no action. And I think at this point in a, ge in a genocide with what we're seeing, and I apologize for editorializing here, but in a genocide, in a genocide, we, we have to get beyond simply gratitude over statements. Everyone says, you know, people say, oh, well, what are the lessons we have learned from history? What would you do now if you could go back in time to the 1930s? What would you do now? Well, you know what? Whatever you're doing now, that's what you would have done when the Nazis were rising. Mm -hmm. you, if, you, if you're sitting quietly now, that's what you would have done then. If you're taking half measures now, that's what you would have done. Then, if you would have sat in silence uh, uh, as your Jewish neighbors are dragged away, that's you know that that's what people are doing now, and it's not ordinary people because all over the world we're seeing people rising up in outrage, in horror, in 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 despair, in sadness, in solidarity, in strength campuses, uh, trade unions, uh, all over the world, just ordinary people protesting. But the institutions, the governments have failed in this genocide. And yes, it is. I mean, it is the, the United States is primarily responsible. They are the ones who could turn this off with the flick of a switch. But that doesn't get the others off the hook. They, they could, you know, do what you can do. Any government, you know, the smallest government can say no more trade with Israel, no more visas for Israeli officials. If they set foot in our country, we're going to arrest them. This is all we can do, but we're going to do it. And we're far short of that at this point. And I just, I'm sorry, but it, it's got to be said. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. I don't think that this is editorializing. I mean, right now we have to make a transition as a medical corps from the idea that our medical humanitarianism, as it were, is a philanthropic measure to transitioning it into a true solidarity measure. And for medic medical work to be truly solidarity-based, we have to exit the frame of thinking of it as being something that is founded in neutrality. And one of the reasons why the medical system is having such a hard time helping, obviously, I think that it would be very difficult to provide medical aid under any context in Israel, but we're failing even by the minimum bar. And a lot of that is because for far too long, all of the organizations tried to maintain what they call neutrality. It's a principle of, for example, the Red Cross. It's a principle of the United Nations. But this is not a moment in which neutrality is possible. And in fact, neutrality is killing Palestinians. So, which, which I think you know, and I, I think that's why we really have to alter the frame. And what we have started to do at GLIA is to match all of our medical efforts with advocacy efforts so that we can continue to both do the important medical work. And yes, it's very important to do surgeries and to see patients and to deliver babies. These are all things that the teams have been doing in the last few days. But at the same time, that is not sufficient. And not only is it our role to act against that, but it is our duty to act against that as doctors. And we have to get out of this weird uh, Western medical frame that doctors are simply non-actors in, in any other domain. Finally, Tarek, um, I just wanted to ask a, a question about how you and your colleagues are doing personally. I know it's, it, it's, it's 
you know, weird to, to talk about how you're doing when, you know, when there's so much, it's, it's incomprehensible, the amount of suffering, but how are you and your colleagues, um, uh, waking up every day, you know, especially the, the you know, the, the ones who are in Gaza um, and continuing to do this work, continuing to treat people the best way they can. Um, what has it taught you personally about, um, a, about your own humanity? I mean, it's a big question, um, but, but what are your, what are your thoughts? What, what is, what's going through people's heads and, and, and hearts right now? As, as medical workers? I mean, it's not an exercise in tokenism to say that like the Palestinians have to be at the center of, of even our experience of our own um, suffering, right? Like, yes, of course, I'm suffering. Yes, of course, the, the members of GLIA who are on the ground are suffering. You know, one of them finally was able to evacuate yesterday and that person is suffering, you know, even having evacuated everybody is suffering. However, at the same time, we have to understand that we all chose to be there. We all chose to go in and we can more or less choose to come out. Our team has, has been stuck for three weeks. Palestinians have been stuck for eight months plus 17 years plus 75 years. Yeah. You know, it's, it is incomparable. So I think one of the things that we always do is we review what we're experiencing in the context of, of the people with whom we are in solidarity, the Palestinians, um, in our case, because we feel so close to them, the healthcare workers, but truly the whole population. And so we first acknowledge and recognize their suffering. Now, in terms of ours, I mean, yeah, of course, like we have, we have for example, in my case, wanting to go into Gaza and being repeatedly denied, arrested, deported, you know, this has been uh, devastating personally, but if I contextualize it, if I leave it just floating, oh my God, I was deported and not allowed in, then it's very hard to understand what's happening. But if you contextualize it inside the exile of Palestinians, that my grandmother never had the prospect of going into Gaza after she was exiled. My grandfather could never imagine going back. And here I had the possibility, then it, it takes on a different flavor. And similarly, when we watch the suffering of the Palestinians, it gives our own suffering meaning because we, we are in solidarity with them. So yes, people are broken. You know, when um, the tent massacre, and I must say, like, I never thought that we would have so many sub massacre types, you know, it's yeah. been devastating to kind of have to invent new types of massacres to describe the depravity. But when the, tent, the first tent massacre, because they have numbers now, you know, when the first tent massacre happened, the GLIA team heard the explosion right away and then saw the smoke right away. And then half an hour later, smelled the burning bodies. And when you smell the burning bodies, like there's nothing else that smells like that. You don't wonder to yourself, what am I smelling? You know what you're smelling. So in that context, you know, they really were devastated. And then to see all of our plans, we had so many contingency plans and all of a sudden the team's on the run because they were pinned down and then all of a sudden they can't stay where they're staying, they have to move to another safe house. And, and that's disorienting and that's devastating and that's damaging. Um, and so they're hurting, but their suffering can't be resolved. Like, you know, so one of them left Two at this point, two of the, our team has have, have managed to leave, but their suffering hasn't ended. Why? Because their suffering is fundamentally intertwined with the Palestinian suffering. And so the only way for the people who have seen these, you know, horrific scenes to start to heal is to know that the victims of those scenes are starting to heal. And the only way for that is, is a just peace not even a ceasefire. I think a ceasefire is a bare minimum line. It really is a just peace that they have to have for us all to feel like we're going to be okay. Dr. Tarek Lubani, you're a good friend. 
uh, and an amazing humanitarian and physician. You're also the medical director of the GLIA project. Um, people can go to glia.org, that's G-L-I-A dot O-R-G, um, to learn more about the work that you and your colleagues are doing. Um, and I, I'm always appreciative of you. Um, and uh, thank you so much for being with us on the live yeah. stream today. Thank you guys for your amazing work as well. Thank you, Tarek. Thanks, Tarek. And, uh, we, we send a lot of love to you and to all your colleagues and to all the medics and doctors in Gaza who are working under unbelievable conditions, driven by great love for yeah. the people that they're serving. And we can feel that in everything you say. Thank you. We'll send it along. Thanks, Tarek. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.